So I've got a list of questions that we've put together. Uh, there are 11 in total and what we've done is basically broken down the discussions and topics that we do see on social media and, and things like that to put them into questions to cover what we think um, you know, are some of the key sort of areas of safety when it comes to working with newborns. So I'm going to start off with our very, very first question. Um, and Kristen, I'm actually really curious, what are the safety precautions that, that you think photographers can take in their studios? Um, so for me personally, I think um, first starting, I, I have two children of my own. So when bringing anyone into your studio, I think of that as bringing anyone to, into your house. So how would you, for example, baby proof your house so t toddlers, siblings of newborns aren't going to get in, they're not going to get into anything as far as cleaning supplies. We know that they love like hand sanitizer or baby wipes. So make sure that all of that is out of their reach. And then, oh, um, you know, don't have, I, I don't have props sitting around that they can fall into or that sort of thing. But as far as newborns go, I think it's really important to, especially when you're working with props, like anytime I'm working with an elevated surface, always make sure that I have a spotter right beside me whether that be mom or dad, just have someone really close spotting that newborn. And as far as siblings of newborns, I always ask the parents, how are they handling the new baby? Especially when you have a toddler that is, say, maybe 18 months to two years old. I want to know, how are they reacting to that newborn at home? Are they are they welcoming that newborn? Um, just so when I go to pose them together, I kind of know what to expect. So just asking the parents how, how they're dealing with the newborn at home. Um, also, uh, as far as keeping the, the temperature in your studio, we want to keep it cold, obviously, for the baby. I set my studio to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. I feel like that's a great temperature for the newborn. As far as space heaters, I personally do not use them in my studio. Um, I just don't feel it's necessary, but if you do feel you need to have a space heater for any reason, I recommend that you use one that if you, they make the ones now that if you touch them, it's not hot to the touch. I don't know, I don't know if it's the infrared or what they're called, but um, they do make a special space heater that if you touch it, it's not hot to the touch. And the biggest thing for me, I have had clients request that I post their big in props that I don't feel is safe that a baby goes in. And I think it's really important as the photographer to speak up, not just say yes, um, that you that you can do whatever they ask, just speak up and be honest and say, I do not feel comfortable posing your baby in said prop. For example, anything that's glass or um, I've had some odd requests as far as like deer antlers or just, just random dust. And I think it's just important to, to say that you are comfortable and that is okay. And I think that the client will appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's that communication that you mentioned, talking to those clients and, and having that really good level of understanding between them and yourselves. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So you mentioned a few things in there, which leads me to my next question, which um, I think, Rebecca, you're going to be obviously the best person to answer this question. And it's how can photographers pr protect themselves if something was to go wrong during a session? So I have a number of things. Um, <laughs> if you're a lawyer, I like to talk, so feel free to tell me to stop talking. <laughs> um, but actually, I'm going to follow on um, from what Kristen said about um, clearing obstacles. And actually, um, from a legal perspective, it's really, really important to do that. We have just had a case recently in Australia involving Woolworths, which is, for overseas viewers, that's one of our biggest grocery chains, chain stores. And in that case, um, they didn't clear the aisles sufficiently and someone came in, a customer, and slipped on a potato chip, one of those crisps. And they actually injured themselves reasonably badly. And it went through all of our court systems, all the way up to the High Court, and they won in their legal case. And 
were awarded over five hundred thousand dollars wow. just for being on the internship. And what the court looked at in that case, which is relevant, you know, to us in our studios, was that they looked at the intervals for which Woolworths were required to clean up the aisles, and they were looking at intervals of fifteen to twenty minutes. So even though Woolworths had policies of tidying up, they weren't sufficient. So I think we need to probably think about that a little bit in our studio, in that you know when you're dealing with a, new, a newborn session, things can actually get moved around and put out. But I think people should be aware of making sure throughout the session that you're constantly clearing up that studio, moving obstacles away, just to make sure that there is a safe space for people to move around. Um, so that's the first thing, just following on from what Kristen mentioned. The other thing I think is a really good policy is to always have a parent in the room. Um, it's actually a policy in my studio. You don't want a situation where you're left alone with the baby. Um, because even if nothing happens, there's no one there to verify that nothing happened. So making sure you actually have a parent at all times in the studio with you. I personally like to have my parents reasonably close so that they are you know, visible to me and they can see their baby. And I know that a, a, can be a tricky issue because you, you, some people like to sort of have the parents move back a little bit so that they can have their workspace. But I think it's really important to sort of maintain that connection with the parents and particularly that connection of the parents to the baby so that you're not in a situation where you're a hundred percent you know in charge and the parents have sort of abdicated all of their control and power and, and aren't in the room or, or are too far away to really see what's going on that's probably a second thing that you can think about yeah absolutely. i'm going to keep talking about yeah, go for it. More. yeah. <laughs> um, so the third thing that i think is Something you might want to consider um, is having an accident book in your studio. So if you, if you have children and they've been in daycare or preschool or kindergarten, whatever your country calls it, you've probably come into contact with an accident book. And what this is, is if something happens, if there is a small accident, then you put it in your book and you just note down what it was. Um, and the parents initial it, which is exactly what happens at daycare. You know, the, you turn up and the, your child's had a little injury, has a bruise, you write it down and you have to, as a parent, initial it. That's a good way um, of sort of recording if something minor happens. The other, it's sort of a double-edged sword because actually from a legal perspective, you've actually put evidence down that something's happened. But the benefit of this is in a situation where you don't feel like anything did happen and however a case has been brought against you later on so after the, the, the session if you have this accident book and you can flick through and show evidence that you record things that happen as they happen in the studio and there's nothing there on that date that that parent is alleging then you've got some evidence that nothing actually happened so it's just something you might want to consider um, and just keeping keeping a record and you can make it really kind of easygoing and flexible you can just tell them you know like in daycares for insurance purposes you know I've got a little accident book here so if um, something you know happens we just make a note of it and I think you can kind of sort of phrase it in a relaxed way so that's something you might want to consider doing um, to give you some kind of protection the next thing, which is getting a little bit more legal, is um, considering whether you want to put an exclusion clause in your contract. So exclusion clauses are clauses like a waiver where you would include it in your contract, which waives you know, your liability um, in relation to something that happens that causes injury during the session. Whether that will be effective or not is debatable. Um, we see there is in australia at least there is specific um provisions for recreational and leisure places so if you've gone to the gym um or if your child does taekwondo you've probably signed a waiver form so that if there's an injury that happens in the class then the taekwondo studio is not liable so that's something you, you know you might want to consider putting in your contract um, i would suggest you get legal advice on 
whether that is going to be something that will stand up in the location you're in and also in terms of how you draft that but it's, it's definitely something to consider and note that you would need parents to sign it so that they're aware that there's a, a waiver clause. And then the last one, which is the thing that most people think about, is insurance. Um, so do you want me to talk about that now, Kelly? Yeah, so um, which, if you're going into insurance, I might just throw in my next question because I think you're going to be, again, it's going to follow on from, from talking about insurances, is can a photographer be insured if their business is not registered? as in terms of having a, um, an ACN or an ABN or um, and in the United States, I believe it's an LLC or something like that. So registering your business with your local um, government. Yeah. Okay. It, that's, it's actually a really good question. And the short answer is, I don't know, because it's going to be a question of whether the insurance company decides to give you insurance. My feeling would be that questions would be raised as to why you, you are know, requesting a quote for insurance for a business if you don't legally have a business. So I think taking a step, one step back from that question, I would be wanting to ask someone why have they not registered their business legally? Because it's kind of the first step before you even get to insurance. And in Australia, actually, um, you are required to register your business name if your name is not your own. So if I was trading um, my business as Rebecca Connolly, I wouldn't be required to register it. But as soon as I add the word photography at the end, I'm actually legally required to register my business name. If you register your business name, you can't do that without having an Australian business number. And to get an Australian business number, it's actually free. So it doesn't cost you anything. So I really would encourage, you know, people who are running a business to actually do that and to register your business name. Again, it's like under $100. It's not only a, a huge expense. And if you do that, you then also get the benefit of having all of the government information packages that are available to you for running small businesses. And they have an amazing amount of information there. So I think I, I would want you to wonder why you weren't registering. So definitely become legal, register your business, um, register the name, get the number, pay your taxes, <laughs> and then you would be able to get your insurance. So whether they would give you insurance without that, I would like to tentatively say, I don't think so, but you know, that's going to be more of a question of whether the insurance company itself would do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but do you want me to talk a little bit about insurance? Yeah, just cover briefly, um, you know, if you're not insured and something happens, you know, what you're liable for and the different types of insurances that we probably should consider having as business owners and photographers. Okay. So in Australia, most people run their photography business as a sole trader. So what that means is it's basically you trading as your business name and it's you personally. And it's the easiest sort of business to set up. You wouldn't normally create a corporation unless your photography business was significantly larger. So most small businesses in Australia are actually sole traders or partnerships. Um, what that means legally is that you personally are liable for the sort of the costs and expenses for your business. And you're, even like when you're taxed, you're taxed personally under your personal tax return. So what we say in legal terms is there's no kind of corporate veil between you and your corporation. The business is you. So if something happens in a session and something goes wrong and a um, legal proceedings are brought against you, it's brought against you personally, which means all of your assets, all of your income, eventually your partner's assets, if they're, particularly if they're in joint names, that's all up for grabs. Um, so that's where insurance comes into play. Now I do know um, in the US, 
it can be a little different um, depending on the state that you're registered in. You may have options to register as an LLC, which gives you some sort of protection. But that still wouldn't be sufficient protection to not have insurance because what insurance, and we'll, we'll go through the different types, but the insurance that you're looking for is insurance that covers both your legal costs and any payout. So the thing to remember about legal proceedings is you have no control over whether someone brings proceedings against you. They can just commence them. And once they do that, you will instantly start incurring costs to defend those proceedings. The first thing you'll have to do is, is go and see a lawyer. And as soon as you see a lawyer, don't hate us. <laughs> as, soon as, you see, as soon as you see a lawyer, they're going to start charging you. And they charge in six-minute increments, right? It's pretty, it's pretty harsh. So every minute that they spend responding to that letter that you got, you're charged for. Mm -hmm. So even if you've done nothing wrong, you will start incurring costs. So you, you need insurance. Um, do you want me to talk a little bit about the types of insurance? Yeah, I know what I'm yeah no, oh, no, go for it. The business <laughs> advice that you're giving is invaluable to photographers out okay. there. So because we're in an unregulated industry, you know, it's an, and a lot of people start being a photographer and they've never run a business before, they're not aware of all of these things. So I think it's they, really, really valuable. Okay. So there are a couple of types of business insurance and they might be called different names depending on you know, which country you live in, but they're generally going to be very similar. So the first category you want to look at is what we would call business insurance. So this is insurance that will cover the cost to your building, um, to your stock, to theft, anything relating to you know, your topography gear. So if, you, if your gear gets broken or stolen, so that's you, you know, insurance for for your business um, insurance. So most insurance policies will, will include a quote for that. The second um, type of insurance that you might want to consider is related to income protection or income insurance. So this is really important if you are the sole provider for your family. So income insurance um, will cover things like if you're sick, if you get really sick and can't work for six months, that is six months of income that your family won't have. So you may want to consider you know, looking at those. And also um, I would throw into that category things like life insurance. So as our own business owners, we don't, you know, we don't necessarily have these things protected. We're not part, we don't have an employer sitting over the top of us who could you know, pay our wage if we have to take four weeks off. Um, so there's no sort of protection um, insurance for your income that you can consider. The last one that is the main one that people think of is what we call public liability insurance. So public liability insurance is protection for when you are found legally responsible for an injury caused to a third party or to third parties' property that was a result of your activities, the activities of your staff, or as a result of your business activities generally. So this is where we're thinking, you know, legal proceedings. And every business absolutely should have public liability insurance. There are different types of coverage that you can choose. So the general kind of coverage levels in Australia are 5 million, 10 million and 20 million. And you can choose, you know, which level of coverage you want. Um, I know the next question I will get <laughs> is which coverage should I choose? I can only tell you what I've gone for, which is the top one, which is 20 million. The, you can never have enough coverage for legal proceedings. Um, they are very, very expensive. And the difference for what you would pay for your insurance between say 10 million and 20 million, it's not a lot of money. Like it's not a big difference in price. So I would always recommend going for at least 20 million. And if something happens, which we always hope nothing does, but if there is a serious injury and we're dealing with babies here, 
then you could easily be hitting that 20 million in legal costs and a payout. So I, I, that's what I've done, but definitely think about your, yourself and what you want um, in terms of which insurance you go for. Before I forget, because I am going to forget, I need to mention something that's really, really important that most people do not know. And if you take nothing away from my talk about insurance, please note this. This is really important. If you are running a home business, I need you to go and get out your insurance contract right now because quite often in your home insurance policy, there will be a provision in there that if you're running a home business, your insurance policy for your house is void. Wow. Yes. And a lot of people don't know this. So they, they do one or two things. Either they think, oh, I've got a home insurance policy. I can just run my business so they have nothing separate. Or they'll have one policy for their house and one policy sort of for their business and they think that that's fine. Um, and it's, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not, um, particularly if you have that clause in your home insurance you avoided your home insurance. So if a fire comes through and your house is destroyed and there's evidence that you ran a business from home and they will investigate and with things like Facebook and internet presence, they will find out that you've done it and if you've got that clause, they will deny your claim. So please check that. Um, the problem also is if you have two insurance policies, even though your home insurance is totally fine with that, you can run a business and it's okay. If you have a separate policy for business, you, you run the risk of finding yourself in a situation where your insurance company policies, they're arguing with each other as to whether the thing you're claiming was a business problem or a house problem. Yeah. And you're sitting there with no payout. You know, was the fire caused by business or was the fire caused by, you know, random circumstances for your house? And the insurance companies will do anything to not pay. So they'll then fight with each other as to who pays. And meanwhile, you're left without, you know, having that money come through. So check that. There is a way around this. Um, some companies, I know in Australia, double AMI, Amy, they will actually offer you a combined insurance policy for home and business. And so you're totally covered. But just please note that um, even if you're not, you know, you don't think you're running your business from home, but if you've got clients coming, if you're meeting them, if you're doing, you know, consultations at your house, just be very careful that you don't void your home insurance. Yeah, absolutely. That's some really incredible advice. Um, one other thing that I think a lot of people who are running home businesses aren't aware of is that you often have to be allowed to run a business from your home in terms of zoning. Yes. So if you are you're found to um, live in a certain area of wherever it is that you live and you it says that you're not allowed to run a business, business from that home and you are, you could end up in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And also... Um, there's sometimes that even a home business is allowed, but it's only allowed with consent of council. So you'll still need to go through that um, and make sure you get that consent. The other thing is if you live um, in a, a, like an estate, if you sometimes you can have these little estates where they have houses in, a, in these little communities, they'll also have their own regulations and bylaws, and you need to check those because sometimes they will say no home business as well. So, yes, you definitely need to to make sure you've got those you know, approvals because even though you're running it inside, I think your neighbours, they're, they're not silly. They'll, 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 they can see what you're doing. Yeah, you're absolutely. There's lots of cars coming in and out. <laughs> it only takes one neighbour that is not happy with you uh -huh. <laughs> to report it to council. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can jump on to your local council, um, local government's websites, and they have all of the information and applications that you can, uh, you know, apply for to get all of those right permits in place. But um, right. you can't protect yourself enough, basically. <laughs> yes, basically. Yeah.